Hey, welcome back everyone to a video about strange things. Back in 2019, we did a series of videos on strange facts about some places. We did seven cities in one country. Maybe we'll do more in the future. Watch these videos. If you think we should resurrect this series, let us know in the comments section and let us know which one you'd like to see. But we'll start off with the first one, Be More or Baltimore. Let's take a look. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the world according to Briggs. My name is Briggs, and I like to talk. A lot, actually. Really. Some people golf, some people paint, others cure deadly diseases. I talk a lot. Today, we're going to talk about a city that's been all over the news, Baltimore, Maryland. It's right here, in case you don't know, about an hour or so up the Baltimore-Washington Parkway from Washington, D.C. So Baltimore has been getting some bad press lately. Things have been brought up in the news, painting the Charm City in a really bad light. Yeah, that's their nickname, the Charm City. The thing is this, they have their challenges and they have their issues, but they aren't the worst in anything. Every city has problems, but Baltimore's aren't as bad as they're making it seem these days. Most dangerous, they came in third. Poor they came in sixth, the worst schools, they were only 16th, and the worst all-around city, they came in 13th. So they're not the absolute worst. They're not doing great. They have some issues, but you know, they didn't even make the top 10 and overall worst. Baltimore is filled with good people that care about their city. Talk to someone from Baltimore about Baltimore, and I promise you, they will tell you it's a great city. What is going on in Baltimore in the news is what they did to Chicago a few years back. They made Chicago seem like it was like this war zone. They have some bad things, they had some murders, but they also have 10 times as many people as the next city on the list. Basically, they're making Baltimore seem far worse than it is. Baltimore is a historic city with a lot to offer. Over the last several years, they've become a tech city. In 2018, Forbes magazine ranked Baltimore as the fourth hottest tech spot in the country. So that's really good news. Bright future there. But enough of all that. Today's list is about the weird things in Baltimore. Stats and rankings are nice, but more interesting are the strange happenings, places, and people of Baltimore. And now the disclaimer. If you're from Charm City or know about Baltimore, you've probably heard heard some of these, if not all of these. 90% of the people watching this right now haven't. Keep that in mind before you leave your comment. All right, so why don't you grab a pit beef and a natty bow and watch my top 10 strangest things about Baltimore. Number 10, streetlights. The very first streetlights were established here in Baltimore. In 1817, it was discovered that hydrogen gas lamps could be used to keep the streets lit at night. Hydrogen gas lamps were used until electricity was, you know, sometime later. They used to have a dude that would walk around the streets lighting these things up every single night. Good thing we figured out electricity. You'd have to have an army of lamp lighters to cover Baltimore these days. It's huge. Then, of course, you'd have the hooligans going around blowing out all the lamps at night. Sort of like taggers. I guess they would be blowers. What if they made it a felony and you got arrested for it and it goes down on your record as if you're a felonious blower? Nobody wants that on their record. That's disgusting. Gas lights in Baltimore have been gone for 62 years now. The gaslight era in Baltimore came to an end on August 14th, 1957, when then Mayor Thomas L.J. D'Alessandro Jr. extinguished the last gas lamp in Little Italy. Number nine, dentistry. Baltimore is very big on teeth. The world's first dental school was established in 1840. Some say Doc Holliday even studied here for some time before graduating in Pennsylvania. If you aren't sure who that is, he's an old West gunslinger and friend of Wyatt Earp. He was one of the men at the OK Corral, and it's said that he fired the first shot. So yeah, that's interesting. Baltimore is very proud of their dentistry. You know that because they got the Museum of Dentistry located in the city. I bet that place is just packed with people every weekend, especially kids. George Washington's wooden dentures are in the Museum of Dentistry. Did any of you hear that when you were in school? George Washington had wooden teeth. Well, he had several pairs. They were made out of varying combinations of rare hippopotamus ivory, human teeth, and metal fasteners. They weren't made of wood. The teeth would easily turn brown without regular care or cleaning, and their occasional nasty appearance may have first got the ball rolling with the rumor that he had wooden teeth. Number eight, the six pack. The six pack, we're talking about six pack of beer, not something I haven't had since I was 20. Anytime you go buy a six pack of beer, you can thank the good people of Baltimore for this. At the time, in the 1940s, the National Bohemian Brewing Company, now Paps Brewing Company, started selling beers by the half dozen. Since it seemed that four were too few and eight seemed to be a too much, they decided to just go with six per pack. I wonder if they did any research on that or just guessed. Did they do like a study with different control groups? One group was given eight beers, one was given four beers, and then one was given 
a placebo of non-alcoholic beer. Then they'd have to go bowling. And if they did really, really bad, you knew they didn't drink any beer. If they did really, really good, you know they had too many. And if they were just kind of mediocre, they only had four beers. You know, you ever notice that bowling is the only sport that being drunk actually helps your performance? That and hitting a knuckleball in baseball. Number seven, the Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens is an NFL football team that was hijacked from Cleveland, Ohio. The city of Baltimore stole the Browns football team from the city of Cleveland by making a sweetheart deal to the then owner of the Browns, Art Modell. He relocated to Baltimore, basically. After threats of legal action from the city of Cleveland and the fans, a compromise was reached in early 1996 that allowed Modell to establish the Baltimore Ravens as a new franchise while retaining the contracts of all the Browns players. So you got to take all the people and stuff like that. You just couldn't take much else. The Browns' intellectual property, including the team name, logos, colors, training facility, and history, were kept in a trust, and the franchise was regarded by the NFL as suspended, with a new team to be established by 1999, either through expansion or relocation. The Browns were announced as an expansion team in 1998 and they resumed play in 1999 and I've been happy ever since. Well, not really because they've sucked up until like last year, almost that whole time until like last year, they have sucked horribly and I'm a fan and I'm still a fan even though they suck that long. As you can imagine, there's a lot of things wrong in my head. But back to the Ravens. Many people don't know it, but the mascot actually dates back almost 175 years to 1845 when Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven was published. Great poem, great piece of literature. Even if you're not into it, read The Raven someday. Piece of art. Anyway, since the famous writer died on a park bench in Baltimore, he was poisoned. It only felt necessary for the Raven to represent the city. Nevermore. Number six, the USS Constellation. Docked in the Inner Harbor is the last Civil War ship that's still floating today. The Constellation was commissioned on 28 July, 1855. And after 100 years of service in 1955, she was decommissioned. And she had been decommissioned in 1933 and then recommissioned in 1940, just in case there's any ship nerds out there about to give me an angry comment. Anyway, by this time, she had seen some better days. So after they completed a restoration process, she was taken to her permanent berth, Constellation Dock, Inner Harbor, Pier 1. On July 4th, she was designated a national landmark on 23 May 1963 and in 1994 it was condemned as an unsafe vessel so like I said this ship has seen some good days and some bad days. The Constellation was put into dry dock at Sparrow Point in 1996 and a nine million dollar rebuilding and restoration project was undertaken and completed in July of 1999. In an attempt to safeguard the wood, they kind of painted it this fiberglass paint, and now it's like got this weird aqua blue color to it. It's kind of strange, but hey, that's what they went with. As of 2015, the organization responsible for the ship's maintenance enlisted local inmates for repair and cleanup on the ship. I wonder if any of those inmates are felonious blowers. Number five, Baltimore Airport. The Baltimore Airport is an interesting one, to say the least. Actually, strange is a better word. The full name of the airport is the Baltimore Washington International Thurgood Marshall Airport, but most people just call it the Baltimore Airport or BWI. Since the airport can be pretty stressful, BWI offers many amenities like spas, a gym, a meditation room, as well as hiking and biking trails. Really, hiking and biking trails, all within the airport. It's not just nearby, like in some woods near there, it's like surrounding the airport, like right on the, it's in the airport property. It's weird. I've been through this airport a couple times and it's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. They only see like 250 flights a day. To give you an idea how small that is, O'Hare in Chicago sees about a thousand a day. Atlanta and Dallas see in the 900s. Los Angeles is LAX. They see 750. Kind of small. I thought it'd be much bigger. That's weird. Number four, railroad drama. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad is the oldest railroad in the country. I hate the word railroad because it's like a tongue twister to me. Anyway, the B&O Railroad is so special, it even got a spot in Monopoly. Always got to get all four of the railroads. Always. The B&O line was a major part of the Western expansion. B&O started service in 1830. Things were going smooth until violence broke out in 1877 during the Great Railroad Strike when the B&O Company tried to lower the wages of the railroad, railroad, rail workers. Damn it. Of the rail workers. Between the workers and National Guard, war kind of broke out. Ten people were killed and some of the railway had been burned. <laughs> I guess they start burning things. Anyway, isn't that like the first thing you learn in business school? Don't lower the wages of current employees. Bad things happen when you do that. Anyway, ten people were killed and I promise you not one of them was in the meeting where they decided to lower the wages. 
number three, John Hopkins. John Hopkins is a very prestigious private research university located in Baltimore. The university was named after John Hopkins. I say that in case the name didn't tip you off that it was named after a dude named John Hopkins. Anyway, he was an entrepreneur who had many ties to the b Railroad. At his death, Hopkins donated his fortune of $7 million to fund the hospital and university in the area. At the time, his fortune would have converted to today's money about $150 million, so he gave him a good chunk of change. Because of this great honor, with the donation, the hospital and university were built in his name in 1876, just three years following his death. The good news is, he wasn't in on that meeting about lowering the wages, and he wasn't the dude that called the National Guard in to crack some skulls, so he was a decent dude, I guess. Number two, the Great Baltimore Fire. In 1904, Baltimore experienced a horrific fire which was named the Great Baltimore Fire. Is it my imagination or does like every major city have a great fire in their history? I mean, I get it. They had a lot of wood buildings back in the day, but were they like using kerosene-soaked newspaper as insulation or something? This fire raged for two days in February of 1904, and it took 1,200 firefighters, both professional and volunteers, from the surrounding counties to keep it under control. 140 acres of the city were destroyed. 3,500 residents were left unemployed. Amazingly, no one died, but the damage totaled about $150 million, which converted to today's money is about almost $4 billion, 3.84. That's amazing. That's a lot. What's really amazing is nobody died. I would have at least expected one person would have died, like the guy drinking moonshine all day that was lighting off fireworks to celebrate Independence Day five months early. He should have died. And number one, the telegraph. The electric telegraph was the first ever text messaging device. The very first telegraph was invented in 1774 and could only be used between two rooms. This wasn't very useful. I mean, it was just the next room. What was that good for other than sending a message to your wife? Bring me another natty bow. The Orioles are an extra innings. I mean, that's about it. But... It wasn't until 1844, after many revisions, that Samuel Morris was able to make an electric telegraph travel 44 miles from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. Samuel Morris was also the inventor of Morse code. If you don't know what the Morse code is, congratulations, you're probably under the age of 30. I learned the Morse code when I was in the Army. Don't know why. I never used it once. Well, except I used it to tap, you're a dick, every night for a month on the wall between me and the dick that lived in the next room. God, he was a dick. Baltimore was essentially the birthplace of the telegraph. All right, next up, we have the Big Apple, New York City. There's been a lot of weirdness that went on in New York City over the years. I mean, you could watch any historical thing about New York City and just find out there's been some really strange stuff that went on in this city. Let's take a look at some of the facts. What is going on, everyone? How you holding up? I hope good. Remember, every day above ground is a good day. Don't know why I just told you that. That's just something I always say whenever I'm having a bad day. I'm not having a bad day, so I don't know. Next time you're having a bad day, say that to yourself. Let me know how it worked out. Today is a good day because we're gonna be taking a look at the Big Apple, New York City. Here it is in case you're under the age of six and have never really looked at a map to this point. New York City is weird. Some of the strangest happenings have gone down here. From the tragedy of September 11th to the fact that there are 10 times more reports of people being bit by other New Yorkers every year than shark bites reported worldwide. That's real, that's not a joke. New York is one of the most populated and busiest cities in the world, so the chance of them having a good amount of strange things is high. Today, we're gonna look at 10 of them. I could probably do 10 lists of 10 strange things about New York, but we're gonna go with the first 10. Before that, let me give you the quick disclaimer. If you're from New York or familiar with the city, you've probably heard some, if not all of these, before. The list may be nothing new to you. That's okay, most people haven't heard these things. For you, I would say wait till we do strangest things about San Francisco to be shocked. But for everyone else, this is a good list. All right, now that we got that out of the way, why don't you sit on back and watch my top 10 strangest things about New York City. Number 10, I walk on dead people. To live in New York City, you kind of have to be comfortable with the idea of dead people, the idea that a lot of dead people have died in this city, and the idea that sometimes you'll be walking straight over many of their graves. Not kidding. The thing is, several parks are built on top of old graveyards in New York City. Madison Square Park, Bryant Park, Washington Square Park, and Union Square Park, they all used to be graveyards. Washington Square Park sits on top of at least 20,000 graves. 
The good news is they kind of stopped this whole practice of uh, parks on top of graveyard thing. They now have Hart Island. Hart Island is located in Northeast Bronx, and since about 1869, this is where the unidentified bodies of the city are buried. They get a lot of unidentified bodies, and they get a lot of unclaimed bodies every single year, and they put them in mass graves. Kind of sad, kind of depressing, but let's move on. In the past, it was used as a quarantine station in the 1870 yellow fever epidemic. That was one time. The island also contained a woman's psychiatric hospital called the Pavilion, and at another time, it was used as a work camp for boys. So this place kind of has come full circle, sort of being there for all the negative stages of a person's life. There are some really creepy YouTube videos on Hard Island. You should look them up. They're pretty weird. Number 9. The Wickoff House over in Brooklyn on Clarendon Road, you have a McDonald's, an Amco Transmission, a tire shop. Oh, and you also have a house that was built almost 300 years ago. The Wickoff House was built in 1652 and is now a museum, historical landmark type thing. It's been that way since 1967. Anyway, this house is said to have been one of the first structures built by the first settlers in the area and is the oldest Dutch salt box home in America. If you didn't know some of the first Europeans in New York were Dutch, you probably also didn't know it was once called New Amsterdam. The house has not been updated too much to kind of preserve the authenticity, you know, to give the visitors a good idea how the first settlers of our nation lived. If you look at it on Google Street View, it looks like it was being updated a little bit when that ridiculous Google car drove by. Like I said, it also sits across from a sad looking car wash on a rundown street. Kind of depressing. I'm sure the neighborhood has changed a little bit since it was built. It is believed that a majority of Americans with the name Wickoff are descendants of Peter Clausen Wickoff, who was the dude who built the house, with, you know, lived there with his wife and their 11 kids. Peter Clausen was forced to adopt a surname in 1664. He chose Wickoff, and that's the name of the place he lived when he was an orphan, I guess. At the time, there was no other known Wickoffs in America. Some 60 known variations of that name appeared between 1790 and 1900. So pretty much if you run into anyone named Wickoff, there's a really high chance they're a direct descendant from that dude. Number eight, proud of bad stats. 2018 was a great year for safety in New York City. The homicide rate was less than average, and the overall crime rate was down 1.3%. There were 76 days last year without a single murder reported. What is surprising about that is six of those days occurred consecutively. This never happens. From December 22nd to the 26th, there was not a single murder reported. It was like a Christmas miracle or a Festivus miracle, whichever you prefer. In 2015, they had more homicides, but they actually went 15 days in a row without a single one. That's a phenomenal number for a big city like New York City. If you're someone in a small town in Kansas thinking to yourself, well, that's no big deal. We haven't had a murder here since, oh, just after World War II when old man Winslow mistook his neighbor's tractor for a German tank. We all knew he had problems, but nobody figured he brought a bazooka home from the war. But yeah, by New York standards, that's a great stretch. 12 days and six days, that's not bad. Number seven, the underground park. Although it's not complete and won't be open for another two years, the world's first underground park is in the works on Manhattan's west side. This park will have real trees and grass. There will be skylights to let in natural light so that it'll be just like a real park. They're really going for realism. No word if the realism is going to go as far as letting homeless spend the night, but they want it to be as real as possible. As of right now, it's on track to open sometime in 2021. They had a test park not too far away called the Low Line Lab. It was very popular. Probably a little too popular. People stood in line for blocks to get into what essentially was a big terrarium. No different from a basement where people grew their weed back before most states made it legal. That's pretty much what it was. A big warehouse terrarium. It's strange. But people stood in line forever for it. Now what is cool about the lab and the soon to be open park, they use solar devices on the roof of the building to deliver sunlight underground. I'm not sure how much artificial light will be used, but it could be a nice little addition to the concrete jungle. As long as people don't turn it into one of these places that you go there to be seen. You know, like they had a wine tasting at the indoor park or they had an art show at the indoor park. A bunch of people that don't care about the park are just standing around hoping to get seen. Hate that. I went to one of those art openings in New York one time. It was actually comical to me. I mean, I'm not, I'm from California. We don't do things like that. And it was comical how those people acted. And I, you could just tell they were there to be noticed by someone, something, whatever. It was weird. 
Number 6, Track 61. Track 61 is a storage track butted up against a private rail platform in Manhattan. It is located beneath the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. The platform is part of the Grand Central Terminal Complex and it has some history, besides the various haunting stories. Today, Track 61 is a storage track. However, back in World War II, 1944-ish, it was used by various generals and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he wanted to make a quick or discreet exit. Roosevelt is also rumored to have entered and exited via this station in order to hide his worsening polio. He, they did a really good job with that. If you see any old video of him, film, not video, pictures, they hid his polio pretty good for a long time. Track 61, I'm sure, hid the comings and goings of a number of presidents. And I'm sure there's probably stories out there about Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe going through that one. There's always something to do with that one. It's always weird. Whenever you talk president conspiracy, they always bring that one up. Kennedy. It's weird. Anyway, we know it was cleaned up for George W. Bush when he was in the White House so we could have meetings in the hotel and exit that way. You'll see it mentioned in movies about New York City every so often. They even mentioned it in Amazing Spider-Man 2 back with Tobey Maguire. Not that other one. God, that was horrible. What was that middle guy? Andrew Garfield ones. Oh my God, those were the worst. Those middle ones were just horrible. Sort of like the middle versions of Star Wars, that middle series. God, it was horrible. I like the new Spider-Man. I like the Tobey Maguire one so much better than Andrew Garfield. Number five, the capital of the United States. Most people assume Philadelphia or Washington DC were the first capital of our great nation. They're wrong, it was actually New York City. Once the constitution was ratified, George Washington took the oath of office to become the first president of the United States from the balcony of the old city hall. That's right, old wooden teeth himself was sworn into office right down the street from where Kung Fu Tea is today. They also film a lot of uh, Geico commercials in this area. And I was looking at the map of right around where he was sworn in. It is like lawyer central. It's like everyone's got a lawyer office there, it's weird. And of course, Kung Fu tea. President Washington had to find a permanent location for the nation's capital. As part of a compromise, he decided that the capital would move to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1791 for 10 years. And then, you know, they took a more suitable permanent location across the Potomac River in Washington, DC, which then it was just part of Maryland and Virginia. But yeah, the first one was in New York City. Number four, the name. Before 1665, the city was known as New Amsterdam, as the first settlers were Dutch. Remember that old house we talked about earlier? Yeah, the Dutch. The place was silly with them back in the day. The thing is this. On the 18th birthday, the Duke of York was given a pretty big gift, the city of New Amsterdam. That right there is how you spoil a kid. You give him a big over-the-top gift and he's spoiled for life. I'm assuming that's what happened to this dude because he changed the city's name and he named it after himself. So basically, New York is named after a spoiled brat. One little piece of trivia here, the Dutch and English had another dust-up in 1673 where the Dutch regained control of the city and changed the name to of all things, New Orange. Yeah, New Orange. Luckily, they only held control for a few months and it went back to New York when the English took control. Number three, the Statue of Liberty. Many people are aware that the Statue of Liberty was not a product of the United States, but it was actually a gift from the French in 1886. Not many people know that the gift was received in 350 pieces within 214 crates. While the arm had actually arrived in 1876 and it was put on display to raise money for the upcoming construction costs of the base and all that for the Statue of Liberty to sit on, the whole thing came to be because a French political intellectual named Edward de la Belle proposed that France give a statue representing liberty to the United States for its centennial. We were close allies at the time, mainly because we both hated the English. De La Belle figured that honoring the United States' democracy and freedom would strengthen the cause for democracy in France. So basically, he was using us. There are some strange things that went on besides being shipped in a bunch of pieces. The first thing is the United States came up with the money to build the base through crowdfunding. That's right, GoFundMe didn't invent crowdfunding. This was well before the internet and actually the telephone had just been patented the same year the arm got here so we weren't calling people up asking for money. You actually had to do it face to face. How horrible is that? You actually had to go out of your house and talk to people in the old days. Also, the statue has been restored several times and during the 1980s restoration they filmed one of the greatest cheesy movies of all time. Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins. Great fight scene on the scaffolding all around it. You gotta check it out. Number two, gold. 
New York City has the most gold in the world, and it's located within the Federal Reserve Bank. There's about seven tons of gold. That's equivalent to about 5% of all the gold ever mined. Also within the city is a man that mines gold in the sidewalk cracks. Sounds like a local crazy, I know, but he actually made $820 off the amount of gold he found on just 47th Street in six days. That is no joke. Rafi Stepanian was an out-of-work diamond setter that figured if he dug in the sidewalk cracks around the New York Diamond District, he would find gold flakes that had been transferred from jewelry workers' clothing to the ground and eventually into the sidewalk cracks. And he figures nobody's been digging up the cracks of dirt for decades, so why not take a look? I know it sounds crazy, but like I said, he was right. He isn't just finding gold, he's finding diamonds and gems, parts of chains, He's making a good amount of money. He started doing this as far as I can figure around 2011, and as far as I can tell, he's still at it. And number one, the New York Public Library. The New York Public Library has over 50 million books and 92 locations. It is the second largest library system in the nation after the Library of Congress, which I really don't think should count because that one's kind of special. That one's kind of different. This is a public library. That one's just, you know, it's just weird. Anyway, it is also the third largest library in the world. Second, again, if you take out the Library of Congress. Anyway, moving on. If you watch movies from time to time, you've seen the front of the main branch. Those two lions are a dead giveaway. Sex and the City, Spider-Man 3, The Adjustment Bureau, Finding Forrester, The Wiz, Ghostbusters, all included scenes at the main branch. It was established in 1895 and employs over 3,000 people. Think of all the great minds that have strolled those aisles over the years. It's mind-boggling. 1895 to today and going forward, it's just a lot of knowledge has been dispensed in those buildings. All right, so that's my top 10 strangest things about New York City. I hope you guys enjoyed it. hope you got some information out of it. Don't forget all the links below. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit that thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other. All right, moving away from cities, we do one that I forgot. It's really not a city when I did the intro. It's actually a place, Area 51. We all know there's a bunch of strange stuff that goes on in Area 51 none of us really know about. But sometimes little tidbits come out and we know that they are facts. Let's take a look. Recently, we've been doing a series of videos that focus on strange things about different cities. We've done Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Chicago, and Orlando. Today, I thought we'd do it a little extra strange and look at what supposedly houses extraterrestrials, that's right, Area 51 in the Nevada desert. We talked about Area 51 in a couple other videos, but never really focused too much on it. If you don't know about it or where it's at, it's right here, and it's a US Air Force testing site that many believe has aliens from outer space housed here, like the dead bodies. Carcasses of aliens are supposedly here from a alien spaceship crash in the New Mexico desert near Roswell back in the 40s or something. Lately, we've had all kinds of noise about people wanting to storm Area 51 to see them aliens is what it's called. And it's really not a serious thing. At least it's not supposed to be. On June 27th, 2019, Maddie Roberts, a California resident, created a Facebook page as a joke, not realizing that millions would rally behind his battle cry to see them aliens at the secure Air Force facility in Nevada, like I said. It was a joke. Not everyone took it as a joke. There's some people floating around the internet that see this as a serious matter, as serious as erectile dysfunction. Yes, that's serious. Maddie Roberts said that he's been getting direct messages and emails from people that say they're willing to die for the cause. Maddie's response to you people has been, it's not a cause, it's a joke, knock it off. Now, officially the facility is called Homey Airport or Rome Lake. The U.S. Air Force acquired the site in 1955, primarily for flight testing of the Lockheed U-2 aircraft. It was a spy aircraft back in the Cold War. It was actually pretty amazing for its time. Now, it is a very secure military facility. It is in the middle of nowhere and should be left alone, but that doesn't mean some strange things haven't gone on there. And that's what we're gonna look at today. So sit back, adjust your tinfoil hat, and watch my top 10 strange things about Area 51.
Number 10. It's censored. Some of the world's biggest secrets are meant to stay secret. That's why even on Google Maps you can't find this place. Like North Korea, for example, there's no Street View available. I'm sure North Korea has their own version of Street View, probably called something like Dirt Road View or something. They don't want their people getting Americanized or, you know, seeing things that we see so they make their own. Like, they actually didn't want their people getting a hold of Netflix or anything like that, so they made their own streaming service, and no joke, it's pronounced Man Bang. That's right, Man Bang. Spelt different, but it sounds like Man Bang. Anyway, just like North Korea, Area 51 does not like visitors. That's why it's actually censored on Google Maps. When you get near it, like you zoom in towards Area 51, it gets blurry. However, that's kind of changing, I think. You can now view close enough to see that they actually have a baseball field. Yes, they're playing baseball around dead aliens. Number 9. Eisenhower President Eisenhower played a key role in the beginning of Area 51. Originally, the space was granted approval by President Eisenhower for the CIA to develop the Lockheed U-2 jet. The space was needed because of the secrecy of the project. President Eisenhower approved it in 1955. This is the same president who famously burned the defense industry on his way out of office. There's a great documentary about it called Why We Fight. It details the whole thing. You should check that out. But he was a general and basically, you know, World War II and stuff like that, and he saw that how the defense industry was kind of controlling the country and moving us in a direction we probably shouldn't have been going. Long story, great documentary. The CIA publicly acknowledged the existence of the base for the first time on June 25th, 2013, following a Freedom of Information request filled out in 2005. And they declassified the documents detailing the history and the purpose of Area 51. No mention of aliens. Number 8. Immunity. If you're looking to get away with some stuff, work at Area 51. After contractors were exposed to deadly chemicals which ultimately caused their death, their families initiated a lawsuit. In order to conceal the activities happening at Grom Lake, President Bill Clinton granted immunity for any wrongdoing done by anything at Area 51. You know, most of us would do some pretty stupid stuff if we knew we had total immunity. This is probably the only place in the country where people sexually harass the HR rep in the open, thanks to Bill Clinton. Speaking of, the, the year after he granted this place immunity, uh, President Clinton took a vacation to Area 51 with some interns. It was really neat. Number 7. It's painfully obvious. The CIA wants to keep Area 51 a secret for one reason or another. So much so that they acted like the area was completely non-existent until within like the last decade. Like I said, in 2005, a Freedom of Information request was filed. In 2013 was the first time the CIA acknowledged Area 51 as being a real place and releasing documents about the history and purpose. This information was very vague in attempts to continue to conceal the activity taking place within the airport. Airport. I use quotes for that, air quotes for that one, airport. Most of the time you get a good amount of information when you file a freedom of information request. This one was the equivalent of the CIA going, okay, okay, that place everyone knows about, but we've been acting like it's not there. Well, it's there, but not much is going on there. So let's just drop it and go back to watching The Bachelor. Number six, captured aircraft. Although there's no solid evidence that this actually occurred, like most things at Area 51, there's a lot of reason to suspect that there was once Soviet MiG fighter jets that were secretly collected, housed, and tested here at Area 51. For the longest time, they acted like this wasn't a thing. Now, this one's really a no-brainer. Militaries lose stuff all the time. Things get left behind, things get captured, people defect with equipment. Sure, a jet's a big deal, but I have no doubt they got their hands on more than a few. I was in the infantry in the U.S. Army, and for for training, we rode around in Soviet-era armored vehicles, and I was painfully low on the military food chain, and I had full access to these things, knew all about them, and they're only armored vehicles. A jet's a bigger deal, but still, this, this leads me to think that this one shouldn't even be a question. They have them, or they've had them. Here's a strange fact about that one. There was no evidence the CIA ever had one, but according to declassified information, they kind of claim if there was a jet, it was captured during, <laughs> during the Cold War. So, yeah, there's that. Number 5. Moon landing faked at Area 51. As if all those UFO stories didn't get y'all wound up, keep in mind many conspiracy theorists still believe that Area 51 is where they faked the moon landing. Yep, that's right. They think it's a giant cover-up. On top of all that, there's a conspiracy theorist who wrote a book. His name's Bill Casing. He shared in his 1974 book, We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 Billion Swindle, that's the title, that NASA astronauts never really stepped on the moon. Also, according to Bill Casing, these astronauts rarely made it into space. Most sane people People know we have. I mean, if we never made it into space, how did Luke blow up the Death Star? I mean, come on, use your brain, people. And this is where someone wants to make an angry comment about this is real and I shouldn't make fun of it, it's serious stuff. You're wrong. I should make fun of it. That's my job. Stop typing. 
number four, the commute. For those who work in this secretive space, commuting can be pretty tricky. There's no nice highways out there with like a carpool lane and a roadside Starbucks. So if you're looking to, you know, pick up a pumpkin spice latte on the way to the hangar, it's not going to happen. Area 51 is one of the most secretive places in the world, like we've already established. So they really don't like people forming commuter caravans in full view of the public and all the crazies on the way to work. That is why if you are employed here just to get to work every day, you'll have to take a private plane known as Janet with the rest of your co-workers. If you did drive, it's only about two hours away from the Vegas metro area where most workers live, I'm guessing. So that means this is an incredibly short plane ride, so there's really no time for the drink cart, I imagine. But yeah, that's how they get to work, their own private plane. Number three, Air Force affiliation. The Nevada Test and Training Range, which is where Area 51 is located, is known to have ties to Nellis Air Force Base. The NTTR, as it's known, has one of the biggest air and ground capacity in the country, and that's probably why it's used for quiet military operations, like the development of the X-Wing fighter. It is 4,531 square miles. That's bigger than the entire state of Rhode Island and Delaware combined, and almost as big as the entire state of Connecticut. That's a big plot of land that can hold some secrets. Real secrets, not like using a sharpie to hide the waist size on my cousin's ex-wife's Levi's. Real secrets that people want to know. Number two. Legal murder. That's right, officers at Area 51 can legally kill you. If you attempt to break into Area 51 or get a little too close to their very strict perimeters, you will be approached by guards and asked to leave. You could then be issued a fine of up to $650, and if you push it even further than that, you could receive six months in jail. And that's a Nevada jail, which those apparently suck pretty bad. Bad enough to go to prison, but if you're in that heat all the time, oh my god, that'd be horrible. I mean, I'm sure they have air conditioning inside a little bit. Still, not worth it. Worst case scenario for those people who continue to attempt access to the area, you could be legally killed for attempting to gain access. They are authorized to use lethal force. For those of you thinking that they won't do that if you storm Area 51 in the coming months, you're wrong. They will. Don't think that because you're an American citizen, they will not shoot you dead. They will. And they are immune from prosecution. Now, to be honest, I'm sure it's not going to be some zombie movie scene where they're just mowing people down if they touch a fence. I'm sure you're going to catch a couple rubber bullets first and probably some pepper spray. But Keep in mind, if you're dumb enough to test this, you'll be the only one that gets hurt. And number one. Alien tourism. Area 51 has been a very popular spot for some nosy Americans. The closest town to Area 51 is Rachel, Nevada. Rachel is a very small town of just 55 residents, but the town takes full advantage of their close proximity to the secretive place. Alien themed motel called Little Alien, spelt like this, as well as an alien themed highway. There's another town on the other side called Amargosa Valley, Nevada, that has an alien center, and of course, no Nevada alien themed town would be complete without an alien themed brothel. It's real, folks. They have an alien-themed brothel. I'm not even joking. The centerpiece of this facility would have to be the alien abduction and probing center. That's real, too. I'm not even kidding. All right, let's head on out to Florida and take a look at Orlando. Orlando is where everyone seems to think you'll find Disney World. It is in that metro area, but actually it's in a place called Lake Buena Vista and Buena Vista Bay or something like that. But it's, you know, in the metro area, it's just not in Orlando itself. It's actually closer to Winter Gardens. Just recently, there's been a video floating around about Cinderella's castle burning to the ground at Disney World. Watch the video. It's AI generated. It's fake. And if you look, everyone's just perfectly calm walking around. I mean, that should be your first clue. If Cinderella's castle is on fire, everyone's going to be stopping and watching and there's going to be a lot of commotion. I watched the video. It's just fake, and everyone thinks it's real. Anyway, let's take a look at Orlando. What is going on, everyone? It is Taco Tuesday, which means I'll be having a hamburger or pizza. I don't like to be involved in taco exploitation. I just hate it when my favorite things get all commercialized. It's like tacos have sold out and now are working for corporate America. It's just not the same. Now, I know that sounds kind of strange, but not as strange as some of the things about Orlando, Florida. That's right, we're talking about Orlando, Florida once again. We just did a top 10 reasons not to move to Orlando about a month or so ago, and it really got a good reaction. Tons of views, likes, comments, and about 30 emails. I normally get five or six emails about each video, this one was a little different, not just in the amount, but 90% of them agreed with everything I said. That's not normal. Normally, I get emails from people questioning my mental capacity, social status, my manhood, and I also get the occasional inappropriate picture. Don't know why. 
just kind of weird. Today we're going to learn about some of the strange things about Orlando, and it's not all just about Disney. Orlando is right here, it's almost dead center in the middle of the state if you, you know, take out the panhandle I guess. The Orlando area is home to far too many theme parks that any town, city, or area should have. They got Disney World, SeaWorld, Gatorland, Universal Orlando, the Holy Land experience. Yeah, it's a thing. And they even have Fun Spot Action Park, which has the longest go-kart track I've ever seen or been on. It, it was kind of amazing. A little slower than I would have liked, but it was pretty weird. It was nice. It was fun. Millions of people visit this part of Florida every single year and plop down what could be an extra mortgage payment if they, you know, played their cards right. They're plopping down a mortgage payment worth the money just to ride roller coasters, see dolphins jump through hoops, and I, I guess learn about the Holy Land. Still don't get that one. My kids would hate me if I did that. It might be fun. I don't know. I've never been there. But if I took them there and we drove past Disney and Universal and we pulled into the parking lot of the Holy Land experience, I would hear about it till the day I died. My kids would probably wish I would rise from the dead so they could give me some more grief about it. So that being said, why don't we get this video rolling and watch my top 10 strangest things about Orlando, Florida. Number 10. How many people visit? The number of visitors in Orlando each day is the equivalent of the population of Spokane, Washington. That's right. On average, about as many people in the entire city of Spokane show up on Orlando's doorstep looking to be entertained. That's about 205 on average. If you take 75 million, which they had in 2018, divided by 365, that's what you get. The worst part is, these people aren't people that care about the city of Orlando like the locals do. There are some really weird stories of things tourists have done while visiting. One of the emails I got from the last Orlando video was from a girl who worked in a hotel near Disney World. She said she saw a full-grown man start crying and knocking things over because he just found out Disney World did not have a Vegas-style casino in the park. She said, he was screaming at what she assumed was his wife about how she lied to him to trick him into taking the kids to Disney World. He was arrested for shoving a female hotel manager to the ground. She was asking him to calm down, apparently. Orlando gets so many visitors, it's no wonder they have the world's largest McDonald's. This McDonald's has a unique menu that includes waffles, brick oven pizza, and made-to-order omelets. Maybe if they would have told that man about the omelet thing, he would have calmed down. I know omelets really calm me down. Number 9. Disney After Disneyland opened in Anaheim, California in 1955, Walt Disney began buying up thousands of acres of swampland around the Orlando area. He did this under different names and companies, making sure never to use the name Disney anywhere so the locals wouldn't catch on. He was afraid, and rightfully so, that other people would buy land around the site of his future park, drive up prices, and stand in the way of him building his new theme park. Now, that's what happened in Disneyland out in Anaheim. There was a couple places that wouldn't sell out land. I just remember this one story about this little hotel. It was like a motel up against Disneyland. And he always wanted to expand that out direction. But this old guy that owned the motel wouldn't sell out. He asked for like millions and millions of dollars for a piece of property that was worth maybe 500000 Anyway, it was like I heard the day he died, his family sold it to Disney. So yeah, just stood in the way for 30 years for no reason. Just wanted to milk someone when he could have, I'm sure, gotten a really good price. Anyway, Walt Disney World opened in 1971. Among the original rides at the Magic Kingdom were the Jungle Cruise, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Carousel of Progress, the Mark Twain Riverboat, It's a Small World, Tomorrowland Speedway, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, the Carousel, the Mad Hatter Tea Party, the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, and the Enchanted Tiki Room, which I've never been in. Been to Disneyland oh, God knows how many times, but I've never been in the Tiki Room. Don't know why. Some of these attractions are still around to this day. I did hear they, speaking of the Tiki Room, I did hear they're getting ready to change it to something else, but who knows. Number 8. The first Orlando theme park. If you thought Disney World was the first, you'd be wrong. Gatorland was the first theme park to open in Orlando in 1949. Its main attraction was a 15-foot alligator, said to be the biggest in the world at the time. Billed as the alligator capital of the world, Gatorland features thousands of alligators and crocodiles and a breeding marsh with a boardwalk and observation tower. Reptile shows, petting zoo, Swamp Walk, the educational programs, they got it all. I mean, they don't have a roller coaster, but that's no big deal. I mean, how cool would a roller coaster shaped like an alligator be? I mean, the park is known for buying and rescuing nuisance alligators from trappers that would have otherwise been killed. Sort of like what the Oakland Raiders do with athletes that have a bad history. The breeding marsh area of the park was used in the filming of the 1984 movie, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. How cool is that? I remember that scene, it was totally scary. 
Number seven, the Backstreet Boys. The Backstreet Boys were officially founded in Orlando on April 20th, 1993. They named themselves after the city's Backstreet Market. It was an old flea market where the singers used to hang out. The flea market's been gone for some time now. I've never been a fan. Never understood the whole boy band thing. Doesn't mean I don't realize they've got talent. The Backstreet Boys have sold over 100 million records worldwide, making them the best-selling boy band of all time and one of the world's best-selling music artists. They are the first group since Led Zeppelin to have their first 10 albums, I didn't even know they did 10 albums, to reach the top 10 on Billboard's 200, and the only boy band to ever do so. That is some serious achievements. I'm still not going to listen to them. Just don't get that whole boy band thing. Anyway, they became a band after hanging out behind a flea market, of all places. Number six, the lakes. If you ever look at a satellite view of Orlando, you probably wonder why someone would have ever built a house, much less an entire city on this land. Orlando has about 100 lakes, many of which are from sinkholes. Rose Lake, an infamous lake formed from a sinkhole in Winter Park, a suburb of Orlando, was mentioned in the HBO series The Sopranos as a good place to hide a body. Winter Park is also where Mr. Fred Rogers attended Rollins College. Mr. Rogers wrote A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood as his senior thesis. So that's kind of cool. You know, you got, it's a good place to hide a body that you like killed and probably one of the nicest guys in the world went to the college there it's kind of a you know yin and yang there i guess lake eola in downtown orlando is a result of another sinkhole which is 80 feet deep 80 feet deep seems to be a bit like an accident waiting to happen. Most downtown lakes are man-made and you could probably walk across them. Not like, I, when I say walk across them, not like on the water, like something that might be going on down at the Holy Land experience. I mean, they're normally only about three or four feet deep at most and you can just kind of wade through the whole thing. But 80 feet deep in the middle of town, a little deep. Number five, lost and found. Walt Disney World estimates that since 1971, over 1 1.6 million pairs of sunglasses have been handed over to its lost and found department. More than 6,000 cell phones show up every single year, a couple sets of dentures every month, and a prosthetic leg was left in the parking lot more than once. Disney World has to operate 23 lost and found offices on their property just to keep up with things. Who, who forgets their leg? I want to know the backstory to that one. Did they just buy too many souvenirs and popped open the trunk and realized that their uncle who had passed away a couple months ago left like his prosthetic leg there. We don't need this. Just toss it out onto the parking lot and drive off with all those Disney hats and sweatshirts and balloons with the ears on them. It's crazy. Who leaves a leg parking lot? Number four, sinkholes. In May of 1981, the Orlando suburb of Winter Park had a sinkhole problem. Over several days, a sinkhole swallowed up a three-bedroom home, five Porsches, and parts of two different streets. When it finally stopped growing, the thing had become 75 feet deep and 350 feet wide. It was a big hole in the ground. Sinkholes are kind of scary. They aren't always these slow-moving things that happen over two days. In March of 2013, Jeffrey Bush was asleep in his bedroom when the floor collapsed and he fell in. His body was never recovered. Covered. His brother Jeremy was in the house and tried to rescue him, even jumping into the hole. He was later rescued by authorities with the ground crumbling all around him. Like I said, Jeffrey was never seen or heard from again. No postcards, no nothing. Number three, tons of movies. Tons of movies are shot in the City Beautiful. And yes, that's their nickname, The City Beautiful. One of their nicknames, The Waterboy, Jaws 3, Days of Thunder, Parenthood, Transformers, Apollo 13, Armageddon, Too Fast, Too Furious, Magic Mike, and even Sharknado. All had scenes here in Orlando. Orlando has had three city halls in its history, the second of which was demolished in 1991. Beforehand, Warner Brothers received special permission to film the implosion. Their footage was later used in the opening scene of Lethal Weapon 3, and it starred Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, and Joe Pesci. Now, this is back before Mel Gibson went off the rails, Joe Pesci disappeared, and Danny Glover started protesting everything. That man is everywhere. I mean, he's in the Ecuadorian rainforest protesting Chevron. I remember seeing him protest the Iraq war. Everywhere. He just turns up. He's protesting. Got a sign and a hard hat all the time. I don't know what's up with the hard hat. Number two, failed sports teams. Orlando doesn't have a great history with sports teams. They have the Magic with the NBA and they have a Major League Soccer team, some Minor League Baseball. The list of failed sports teams overshadows all the good that has ever gone on 
with Orlando Sports. The Orlando Miracle played four seasons at the Amway Arena from 99 to 2002. After 2002, when the owners were permitted to sell the WNBA team, the Miracle were purchased by the Mohingan Sun Casino and moved and became the Connecticut Sun. Semi-professional Orlando Aces played one season in the new revived American Basketball Association from 2006-2007, and then they moved to Las Vegas. The Orlando Apollos folded with the Alliance of American Football. That was like just last year or something like that. After they won the championship, after one season, they won it and it's gone. The XFL Rage was in Orlando, lasted one year. Pro lacrosse team skipped town, went to New York. They couldn't even keep the Lingerie Football League's team in town. It only lasted a couple years, and they were called the Fantasy. Lovely girls. The attempts to get football in Orlando has been just a series of bad moves. A bunch of teams have lasted one year. The UFL Florida Tuskers played in Orlando for one season. So did the USFL Renegades, the World League of American Football, Orlando Thunder, which had really cool uniforms, by the way. They played two seasons in the early 90s. It's been a bit of a dumpster fire for Orlando sports. And number one, the name Orlando. Orlando's history dates back to 1835, and this was in the middle of the Seminole Indian Wars. The army built Fort Gatlin just south of where Orlando sits today, and it was built to protect the settlers from attacking Indians, like pretty much all forts were built back in the day. In 1840, a small community grown up around the fort, and it was known as Jernigan. The name Jernigan came from a family that established the first permanent settlement in the area. Jernigan had a post office established on May 30th, 1850. Six years later, for some reason, they officially changed the name to Orlando. Apparently the name Jurgen wasn't working for him anymore. In 1857, the U.S. Post Office adopted the name change. The town of Orlando was born with 85 residents. Not a lot of people. Now, there's four stories on how the name Orlando originated. One involves a judge named Orlando after a man that once worked for him. Another is that it was named after a character in Shakespeare's As You Like It. The third version has Mr. Orlando on his way to Tampa with a caravan of ox. Along the road, he decided to get sick and die or got killed some other way. Maybe he was trampled by an ox. Who knows? Anyway, he died and was buried and folks would come by his grave marker and say, there lies Orlando. So they decided to name a city after him. Now, the final theory is about a company of soldiers on duty during the height of the Seminole Wars. After battling Indians back into the swamps on the east side of Lake Minnie, which is now Lake Cherokee, the military troops settled in for the night. Now, they had a guard named Orlando Reeves who was guarding the camp and he spotted a log floating towards him. Recognizing this was just Indians in disguise and wanted to warn his fellow soldiers, he fired his gun. Next thing he knew, he sprung a bunch of arrows. Four dude died there on the side of the lake. Anyway, the camp came under ambush. The Indians were chased back again on the south side of Lake Eola, and that's where they decided to bury Orlando Reeves. So he was buried there in another grave marker story, and they just started calling it Orlando. The last two are the more interesting ones. Naming it after a dude that worked for you is not that, you know, sexy. I would go with the Seminole War ones. Those are better. Always when someone dies and you name something after it, it's, it's, it's a better story, I think. All right, let's head on up to the Windy City, Chicago. Chicago is a very interesting city. It gets a little bad rap these days because it's got a really high murder rate, and it does. A lot of people get killed there, but they got a lot of people there. When you look at the rate of crime and murder and violent crime, they're really not doing that bad. But in total number, oh yeah, they're doing bad. Let's take a look at Chicago. What is going on everyone? Welcome back to the world according to Briggs. My name is Briggs and thank you for clicking on this video. I really appreciate it. Like I've said before, if it wasn't for you guys, I'd just be some dude walking around your town with a camera looking like a suspicious weirdo. Now when people in small towns say, hey, what are you doing weirdo? I just say I'm a YouTuber and they say, oh, okay. I thought you were just some weirdo. Not, I'm a YouTuber. It's like an excuse for doing anything weird. Just tell them I'm a YouTuber and they're all, oh, totally makes sense. Speaking of weird, recently I've started a series of strange things about different cities. We did LA and we did Vegas so far, and I thought we'd move on to one of my favorite big cities, Chicago. Every city has some strange history or trivia. Chicago has enough to scare most people into becoming Canadians. Chicago is right here on the shores of Lake Michigan, in case you don't know. The metro area is filled with people. A lot of them are weirdos. They actually come in third in the country with just under 10 million people. That's the whole metro area. The actual city has about 2.7 million, and oddly enough, that brings them in third too as well. Chicago started off as Fort Dearborn back in 1803, and by 1833 it was a town. It was actually called the Town of Chicago. Four years later, it became the City of Chicago. Chicago has had everything from Indian Wars, Giant Fires, Al Capone, Dub Bears, and Michael Jordan. Chicago's seen a lot of things. Now, here's the disclaimer. If you're from Chicago, 
live there currently, or just know a bunch about the city. You may know some of these, or all of these. Congratulations on knowing some things. I didn't have you specifically in mind when I created this video. Most people watching this don't know most of the things on this list. In some cases, they don't know any of them. So please, don't give us an angry thumb and index finger typed rant about how you knew all these. Okay? Other people don't. That being said, why don't we see what's weird about the Windy City in my top 10 strange things about Chicago. Number 10. Spray paint. Spray paint was invented in 1949 by Edward Seymour in Chicago. Seymour invented it after his wife made a suggestion of putting paint in an aerosol can. His patent was granted in 1951, and then he went on and founded Seymour of Sycamore Incorporated, which today manufactures not only spray paint, but auto paint, industrial paint, farm paint, and private label paint. He's all into paint. And if you ever venture into some of the worst parts of Chicago, or pretty much any city, you're going to find that the youth of the neighborhood are celebrating Mr. Seymour's life work by using his invention on buses, trains, buildings, walls, cars of ex-boyfriends who hooked up with your best friend, and sometimes using it as a party starter. Spray paint. Vented in Chicago. Number 9. Rats. You should have the local pest control company's number on your refrigerator when you move to Chicago. In 2018, Orkin, a national pest control company, announced that Chicago had been the most rat-infested city they had ever experienced. The city also had the most bed bug infestation during that year and the year before. Orkin's latest analysis has Los Angeles in second place, New York City comes in third, and Washington, D.C. comes in fourth. But Chicago is leading the pack. Or should I say... Rat Pack. <laughs> right there. Comedy gold. Just kidding. That was kind of weak. Moving on, Chicago has had a rodent problem forever. If you need any proof past stats and things like that, take into consideration Chicago native Walt Disney made a career and an industry out of a rodent. Number eight, Al Capone. After Tony Soprano, the New York mob boss, just kidding, he was from New Jersey. How many of you already started typing a comment? Anyway, after Tony Soprano, Al Capone was the most famous gangster the United States would ever experience. Between 1920 and 1933, the entire country was on the wagon, or at least they were supposed to be. The U.S. decided a ban against alcohol was needed to fix all of society's issues. They had a wartime ban originally that kind of got the ball rolling for this. This ban did not allow the production, importation, transportation, or sales of alcohol with content higher than 1.28%. This law went into effect on July 1st, 1919. It was also nicknamed Thirsty First. The day before, on June 30th, the city of Chicago experienced over $2 million in liquor sales. What they didn't see coming with all these bans and prohibition was Al Capone and other less famous gangsters. During this time, the city's most notorious gangster, Al Capone, sold $60 million in illegal alcohol sales by 1929. So in like a nine year span, he made $60 million. That's like a billion dollars in today's money. That's a lot of money. So they tried to fix a problem, but they created an even bigger one. And Al Capone was that problem. In the end, what's really funny, if you don't know much about Al Capone, they didn't get him for the illegal alcohol sales. They didn't get him for the prostitution rings he was running and all that, the violence, the murders and all that. They got him for tax evasion. Number seven, they get a lot of cops. The Chicago Police Department is the second largest police department in the country, right behind New York City. And they're pretty much worked to death. Speaking of death, the Chicago Police Department reported 561 homicides were committed between January 1st and December 31st, 2018. Now, with the good news is that's down from 660 homicides in 2017 and 770 in 2016, which also in 2016 marked a 19-year high and put them in the national spotlight during an election year. It had to do with Chicago's persistently high rate of gun violence. It, it's pretty bad. They also have, you know, way more people than the next in line, like I've said many times, but it was bad. And on top of that, the Chicago Police Department had to deal with a series of peeping drones. That's a new tech twist on the old school peeping Tom. I guess you just sit in a park across from a high rise and, you know, launch your drone and see who doesn't close the blinds while they're changing. Sounds like a lot of fun to me for a very lonely person. Don't do that. It's wrong. Anyway, so they may be the largest, but I'd say they're probably the hardest working right now. Yeah, and thankfully those statistics about murder have dropped, so that's good. Number six, the fire. The Great Chicago Fire burned over 2,100 acres of the city during October of 1871. The fire had started in a barn at O'Leary's farm on October 8th. The city was experiencing a serious drought combined with winds that day. It caused the fire to spread rapidly and it burned for like two days. As a result of the fire, 300 people died. 17,500 buildings were destroyed and it left 100,000 residents homeless. At the time, it did $222 million in damage. Today, that's the equivalent of about $4.5 billion. 
Union. Luckily, one of the stores that caught fire had a new shipment of marshmallows, graham crackers, and chocolate, and the s'more was born. I'm totally joking. They aren't sure when it really originated. One of the earliest published recipes for the s'more was found in a book of recipes published by the Campfire Marshmallows Company in the 1920s, where they called it in that, they called it the graham cracker sandwich. The text indicated that it was a treat already popular with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. In 1927, a recipe for some more, it was some more, was published in Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts. That just sounds like a weird name for something. Tramping and trailing with the Girl Scouts. That's wrong. <sighs> different time. But if you look up Chicago S'more, you'll find a couple lists. Just bypass everything on the list. Head to Sweet Mandy B's. The S'more pie is the best thing I've ever tasted that didn't have like barbecue sauce on it. Number five, bad tippers. On June 22nd, 1918, about 100 waiters were taken into custody after a widespread practice of poisoning bad tippers came to light. Only four were arrested and charged. Many people reported being poisoned with Mickey Finn powder by waiters after not tipping well. Mickey Finn powder is chloral hydrate, also known as a date rape drug. And they use it, dentists use it, and it helps to treat insomnia. Anyway, how would you like your actual name to be Mickey Finn and like be single? You're at a bar, you gotta start telling the ladies your name's Steve, because every time you tell them your name's Mickey Finn, the girl just gets up and walks away from you and starts pointing at you while whispering to her girlfriends from across the room. Next thing you know, someone wrote scumbag on your car with spray paint. Both Anna Nicole Smith and her idol Marilyn Monroe had heavy amounts of chloral hydrate in their systems when they died, sadly. Number four. Good medicine. Chicago is a great place to be, whether you're studying to be a nurse, doctor, surgeon, or any other medical professional. It's also a great place to be if you're accident prone, hanging out with the wrong crowd, if you're caught looking in someone's window with a drone, or if you're a professional victim that's getting shot, stabbed, beat up, and attacked by rats all the time. Chicago is where the first and largest urban medical district is located in the country. In the city, there's eight med schools and more than 14 hospitals. About 20% of the doctors in the U.S. have received at least part of their training and education in the Windy City, if not all of their education and training. If you remember back to the murder rate portion of this list, you'll see this is a really good thing. Number three, car racing. The first car race in the country was held in Chicago in 1895. During this time, the vehicle was called a gasoline-powered horseless carriage, and it was created by the Duria brothers in 1893. During the 1895 race, there were two electric cars and three Benz cars imported from Germany, as well as the Duria car. Frank Duria won the race, completing the 54-mile route in just over 10 hours. The average speed was 7.3 miles per hour. So basically, it was a race that couldn't beat an ice cream truck looking for a sale on a block filled with kids. When I was a kid, my dad told me that when they play that song Pop Goes the Weasel over their little speaker system, it's a trick. There's a doctor and a nurse inside the ice cream truck giving out shots and homework. Years later, I heard him tell my brother the same thing, but they were giving out spankings. I don't know. Number two, racism. Chicago used to be one of the most racist cities in the country. Keep in mind, it's not even in Mississippi, and they still pulled that one off. Thankfully, Times are changing and things are improving. And stop typing. I'm sure this is where we're going to have some comments that aren't really needed. Just let it go. Like I said, things are improving, but that doesn't change the past. In the 1920s, Chicago had one of the biggest Ku Klux Klan populations in the country at over 50,000 members. The public schools here didn't even have mandatory desegregation rules until the 1980s. And number one, they reversed the river. When the Chicago River flowed its natural course, it flowed into Lake Michigan. In 1850, the city reversed the flow of the river to stop the city's waste from going into Lake Michigan, which was the source of their drinking water and still is to this day. Basically, they sent it towards Joliet and called it a day. Since the reversal, it has made the typhoid death rate drop by 80% and raised the utterance of the phrase, those aren't muddy waters, it's something else, by 90%. All right, let's head on out west where I was born. I was born in the Los Angeles metro area in a suburb called Torrance, California. This video is about Los Angeles. Growing up here, I know a lot of weird things about Los Angeles, and a lot of weird things in its history. I could have probably done 50 things on this and still had more to go. But here's 10 strange facts about Los Angeles.
What is going on everyone? Let's do something a little bit different today. This great country has its good and it's got its bad and it's got its strange. On this channel we spend a lot of our time talking about the bad, you know, the crime, the poverty, the health, the traffic, and the taxes. You know, that really depressing stuff. What we never talk enough about is the strange and lesser known facts. The thing is this, that is probably more interesting to most people, you know, the weird and the unknown stuff. That's what this video is all about. Some of these will be strange and some of them will be just lesser known trivia about a location. There's a lot of strange in this country, probably more than we need. Every state, every city, and every town has some strange, and a bunch of it is unbelievable. Now, some of you may have heard these in the past, but it doesn't make them any less odd to a person not from that area. So why don't we get started and take a look at my top 10 strange facts about Los Angeles, California. Number 10. The birthplace of the internet. The University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA, was the birthplace of the internet in 1969 after the first ARPANET transmission was sent from the school to SRI in Menlo Park. 50 years later, here we are sending prayers for tragedies instead of showing up, buying everything we need from Amazon instead of actually leaving the house. We're getting dates on websites, like we're ordering pizza. We can even drown ourselves in porn for a month and never see the same video twice. I wonder if the Advanced Research Project Agency knew we'd be doing things like this when they made that first transmission. You know they'd be trying to shut it down if they knew where we were heading. They'd run into your room yelling, turn it off, turn it off. That's not what it's supposed to be for. Stop touching yourself. Number nine. Black Gold 90210. Beverly Hills High School has an oil derrick on the property that produces about 400 barrels of oil a day. The school earns about $300,000 a year in royalties from this little operation. It's kind of weird having an oil derrick on a high school, don't you think? I always thought it was weird. I've known about this. It's been there forever, but I always thought this one's weird. Los Angeles has more than 50 active urban oil fields. Growing up in Los Angeles, we had these things everywhere. We had one at the mall by my house. When I was like 12 or 13, I jumped the fence, climbed on it, and rode it like a horse. I even had an old man yell at me, told me I was breaking the law and the police were on their way. I smiled and continued to ride for a while while my friends laughed and he grew increasingly red in the face. I got off the oil derrick, climbed the fence after a few minutes. He told me I had to wait for the police. I chuckled and we walked away. He followed us for like 10 minutes saying he was making a citizen's arrest, made this big scene. He even tried to enlist other mall shoppers to rustle us all up. After a few laughed at him, he kind of gave up and walked away. Said they'd be fingerprinting the oil derrick later. But yeah, they got these oil derricks everywhere. There used to be a lot more, but they still got them. Number eight, Angel's Flight. At just 320 feet long, the Angel's Flight Incline is one of the shortest incorporated railways in the world. It is in the Bunker Hill District of downtown Los Angeles. It has two funcular cars running in opposite directions on a shared cable. This is the second version of the Angel's Flight. And this one is kind of more or less a tourist trap. The other one was actually functional and helped people get up the hill, especially back in the day. This one's really just kind of a tourist thing. The original location with the tracks connecting Hill Street and Olive Street operated from 1901 until it closed in 1969. Oddly enough, the same year the internet started. It's like they all said, hey, we got the internet now. Why do we need this? We're all going to be working from home. But back in 1969, they cleared it out for redevelopment. The second Angels Flight location opened up one half block to the south from the original location in 1990. So they took a little time off with it, with tracks connecting Hill Street and California Plaza. They've had some accidents over the years, and an elderly gentleman died back in 2001, and that was kind of sad. It's been closed down a couple times over the years, each time for about a year or so for repairs and safety upgrades. It's just a weird little piece of Los Angeles. Number seven, the strangest gift shop ever. Now, this one is what I think is in poor taste, but the Los Angeles County Corner has a gift shop. It's like a morgue with a gift shop. And if you think I'm joking, Google it. What do they sell in here? Do you get like personalized t-shirts made while you're there? That say things like, my grandfather got killed on the world's shortest railroad and all I got was this t-shirt. It is the strangest thing. I heard about this years ago and I didn't believe it. And then I saw someone with a coroner's hat and I'm all, do you work for the coroner? And he goes, no, I got it at the gift shop. I was like, are you kidding me? He goes, no, it's real. And he said, it's weird. That's exactly what the guy told me. It's real and it's weird. Number six, the Hollywood sign. Okay, so the Hollywood sign isn't strange. Everybody knows about it. It's been a beacon for people with dreams of being a star for almost a century. The Hollywood sign was actually 
put up to promote a housing development, not the city or the film industry. The Hollywood sign was created in 1923, but at the time read, Hollywood land. Its purpose was to advertise new housing development in the hills up there. Over the years, it has fallen on hard times and been repaired and repainted and obviously had the land part taken off. One of the people that was part of the repairing of the sign was actually Hugh Hefner. Another strange fact about this one is in 1932, an actress named Peg Entwistle decided she couldn't go on anymore and jumped off the H to her death. Just even weirder about it, the person that found the suicide note found the body and her like shoe didn't call the police or anything like that. She put another note in inside the purse about where the body was and left it on the police station's front door and like ran away. Number five, it's just too big. Los Angeles is so big that it has the most phone area codes. Los Angeles holds more area codes than any other city in the U.S., including 213, 310, 818, 323, 424, 562, 626, 747, and a whole bunch more. There's more being added as I speak. When I was growing up, we still had home phones. Our area code changed twice while I was in high school, I think. Maybe eighth grade to high school, somewhere in there. Twice. And... Cell phones really weren't even a thing yet. I mean, a few people had those big brick type cell phones, but that was it. LA is known as sprawling for a reason. It's huge. It's about 4,100 square miles. Give you an idea how big that is. New York City is just above 300 at 304.8 square miles. It's huge. Number four, the Santa Monica Pier is a lie. If you've ever been to the Santa Monica Pier or seen pictures, it looks like a pier that was built for entertainment and family fun or a great place for a date with its roller coasters, carousel, Ferris wheels, got midway games. Iron Man flew by it in one of his movies. At night, it's a great spot to get some amazing pictures. The Santa Monica Pier has been in a buttload of movies and TV shows like A Night at the Roxbury, Forrest Gump, Falling Down, and one of my favorite 1980s low-budget movies, Desperate Teenage Love Dolls. Yeah, that's a real movie. It was also in one of my favorite episodes of Three's Company. You know, went from Three's Company all the way up to Modern Family and everything in between that was filmed in Los Angeles seems to have had at least one scene on the Santa Monica Pier. Oh, and the Santa Monica Pier was originally designed to protect sewage pipes that dumped treated sewage into the ocean. That smell was not a burnt cord dog. It was built in 1909 for that purpose, primarily to carry sewage pipes beyond the breakers, and it had really no amenities. You could walk on the pier and maybe even fish. All the while, human waste was traveling under your feet on its way to the ocean. Number three, it's a moneymaker. If Los Angeles were its own country, its economy would be bigger than Saudi Arabia, Sweden, and Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. In your face, you cocoa-drinking, army knife-making, yodeling underachievers. Los Angeles makes a lot of money for the state of California and the United States of America. We have a lot of industries there, everything from tourism, aerospace, fence contractors, obviously Hollywood, and many, many more. There is a ton of moneymakers in the city of Los Angeles. Number two, the Olympics times two. Los Angeles has been the only city in the country to have hosted the Summer Olympics twice, in 1932 and again in 1984. The city will also host their third one in 2028. I was in LA for the 1984 Olympics. I thought it was kind of cool, it was really neat. Not a lot of it was going on around my part of LA County, but I mean, other than tourists that didn't bother learning the traffic laws before they got their rent a car, that was a problem. More than a few times I saw people driving their car onto the beaches. You don't do that in LA County, that's not a thing. I know it's other places they do. No place do you do that in LA County. I saw a few people turn on to the bike path that runs along the beach, and of course, the ever popular tourist that thinks every girl in a bikini is a prostitute and should be talked to accordingly. I saw that play out more than a few times, and it always ended up two ways, the tourist getting slapped or catching a beating by somebody's boyfriend. And then they always had that shocked look on their face, like, what's wrong? It was weird. And number one, Thomas Edison was a dick. If Thomas Edison wasn't such a total a-hole, Hollywood might never have happened, and Los Angeles may have never grown at the rate that it did. One of the reasons the film industry settled in Los Angeles was to get as far away from Thomas Edison as possible. Edison helped create The Trust, in 1909, which was comprised of dominant producers, distributors, and manufacturers who were intent on monopolizing the industry. So basically the film industry moved west. California was still kind of a frontierish type state and they had their own courts and they did their own thing. The filmmakers of the time figured this could give them a little more protection from the man that gave us electricity or the man who stole the idea from Nikola's Tesla, whichever story you believe. All right, if you wanna think strange and weird, you gotta include Las Vegas. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. 
What is going on everyone? Let's talk about Sin City, Las Vegas, Nevada. This is the city that helped my channel get traction. I really wasn't growing much until I made a video called Top 10 Reasons Not to Move to Las Vegas, and it blew up. At the time, I was lucky if I was getting 10,000 views a day across my whole channel. When that video took off, I was seeing like 20, 30,000 a day from that video alone. These days, it serves as a place for locals to get some of their anger out. If you ever want to have a good time, read some of the people losing their minds in the comment section of that video. It's great. The best part of the video is the way it came about. Now I've told this story before, so I'll make it brief. I made that video for a friend that was moving to Vegas. It was only meant to be a Facebook thing between friends. Then I didn't have an upload ready for that week for YouTube, so I just posted it. I didn't think anyone would ever really see it. I did hardly any research. It was just stereotypical jokes and stuff like that about Vegas. Here we are three years later making a strange things about Vegas video. Here's the disclaimer. Some of you have heard some of these before, especially if you're from Vegas or living in Vegas currently. The thing is, I didn't make this video with you specifically in mind. Most people don't know these things, so stop typing. That being said, why don't we get this freak show going and watch my top 10 strangest things about Las Vegas. Number 10. Subterranean Urban Campers Buried beneath the Las Vegas Strip is a semi-secret city with hundreds of full-time inhabitants. I've actually heard it's thousands. This population of underground dwellers occupies around 200 miles of storm drains beneath the Las Vegas Strip for the most part. This is the other side of the septic tank of Vegas you won't find on maps. Those card-slapping dudes aren't handing out ads for this place. They aren't just your standard homeless people looking for a place to like bed down for the night. They live down there. They have beds, bookshelves, recliners. It's a village of despair underground. The good news is they don't have rent or mortgage, no place to park their car so they don't need a car or car insurance or any of that stuff. They do have one problem most of us don't. They need a lot of cinder blocks and those plastic milk crates. Water always seems to be trickling through this area and all your stuff will get wet so you gotta keep it lifted. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to live there. Number 9 before the casinos. Before Las Vegas was Sin City, it was a place to watch atomic bomb tests in the desert. They actually made an effort to market it this way. It was like atomic tourism. Sounds crazy now, now that we know what we know about, you know, the effects of atomic radiation and all that other stuff. But anyway, over 10,000 people have successfully sued the U.S. government to receive compensation for fallout-related illnesses. There was a movie being filmed in the Nevada desert during this time. John Wayne, Susan Hayward, and 90 other people developed cancer after filming The Conqueror near atomic test sites. Number 8. Mississippi of the West. Not a pleasant little bit of history, but Las Vegas had its own little Jim Crow thing going on back in the 1950s. You may have heard of the Jim Crow laws. They were local and state laws in the southern states of America that enforced racial segregation following the Reconstruction era in the late 19th century. They were passed by white legislatures and continued to be enforced till about 1965. They were associated with the state of Mississippi most of the time. In the late 1950s, Las Vegas was rather shamefully known as the Mississippi of the West due to its own harsh segregation laws. Gamblers complained about racially mixed casinos, so some laws were passed and forced the African-American population of Las Vegas to live in the west side of town. Dirt roads and rundown gambling places far removed from the glitz of downtown. Obviously, a lot of things have changed. It's just a portion of Las Vegas history that I'm sure they wish never happened. Number seven, the suicide rate. On the outside, Las Vegas looks like everyone is having a good time. That happens when you're drunk and on vacation. It's a place where people cut loose and enjoy themselves. People play games, they relax around a swimming pool, get on roller coasters, they pull handles on flashing machines that sometimes give you money, and they drink their fill. It may surprise you that Sin City has one of the highest suicide rates in the United States. Las Vegas is about three times higher than the national average. That's according to a study done by the University of Nevada. Researchers said that those who visit Las Vegas are twice as likely to commit suicide than if they just would have stayed at home and watched Jeopardy. Some hotels actually have specialized cleaning crews to take care of this problem. That's pleasant. Number six, pawn shops. Everyone's seen the TV show Pawn Stars. It's based in Las Vegas. If you assume they have a buttload of pawn shops in Las Vegas, you'd be wrong. As of 2018, there's only 22 in the city of Las Vegas. You can understand why most people would assume that they have a whole bunch. Gambling isn't a smart move for a lot of people. A weekend of gambling has gone wrong 
far too many times to count. Sometimes you got to sell all your shit. But it is a little odd to only have 22 in Las Vegas. The whole state of Nevada has just around 100. For comparison, Florida has over 1,000, Texas has 960, and Georgia brings in third with 654. Number five, you could do some weird stuff. You can do some really weird stuff in Las Vegas. Drive a race car, shoot a machine gun out of a helicopter, shoot a machine gun while you're standing in the desert, launch a live grenade, bet on anything you want, drink as much as you want, go to the mob museum, go to the atomic testing museum, and you could even hunt girls in bikinis with paintball guns. Or at least you used to be able to. I saw a thing on it, and I'm not sure how that would fly these days with the whole Me Too movement and all that. I know some guys that went and paid money to do this around 2005, 2006. I don't really hang out with them anymore. And just to give you an idea what idiots they are, that was one of the least offensive things they've done. Number four, the Heart Attack Grill. Yes, the Heart Attack Grill. And there is a chance you'll have one if you eat here on a regular basis. Over the last 30 years or so, American restaurants have been moving towards a healthier menu. The Heart Attack Grill has been moving in the other direction. French fries here are cooked in lard. They have milkshakes. They have hamburgers with names like the Triple Bypass, Quadruple Bypass, and the Quintuple Bypass. With three, four, five, or even eight all-beef patties. If you top 350 pounds, you eat for free. Oh my god. I hope my cousin's ex-wife doesn't get wind of that. To make things even unhealthier, they have karaoke. Number three, no FedEx without Las Vegas. Frederick W. Smith is Federal Express's founder. While at Yale, he did a paper on what would become the concept of his company. Smith envisioned a company that could supply overnight deliveries from start to finish with its own depots, airplanes, posting stations, and delivery vans. He got a C on the paper. The professor noted that although the concept is interesting and well-formed, it is simply unfeasible. In other words, the guy who pretty much created overnight delivery was told by his professor it would never work. It has. I just got a contract last week that was FedExed overnight. I think noon or one in San Antonio, they sent it out. It was at my house by noon the next day in Oregon. The thing is, if it wasn't for Vegas, I still might be waiting. Frederick W. Smith went to Vegas with $5,000 in the early days. The company was struggling. So they were running out of money. He took $5,000, went to Vegas and turned it into $32,000, which he needed to keep the company afloat until he got about $11 million in funding from investors. And now we have Federal Express because of Vegas. Number two, marriage and divorce. Now we've all seen those movies where people get married by an Elvis impersonator after a night of drinking, then spend the rest of the movie trying to get out of the marriage. Well, you'd be shocked how often this really plays out. Las Vegas has both the highest marriage rate and divorce rate in the country. I have a buddy that did that. It was a match made in heaven. He was doing some heavy drinking. He met a girl that he had actually paid money to earlier in the day to shoot her with a paintball gun. The marriage lasted two months. Hey, at least those kids tried to work it out. I actually would have loved to see them really put an effort into it, like go to marriage counseling or something like that. I would have loved to hear what went on in those marriage counseling sessions. That would have been terrific. And number one, Area 51. Okay, so Area 51 isn't in Vegas, but... Most of the workers, I guess, are. The U.S. Air Force operates a small airline out of Las Vegas airport that has daily shuttles for workers to and from Area 51. They look like normal commercial planes leaving the airport. When you look closer, you see they have no ID numbers on them, and they have no logo like, let's say, JetBlue or United, something like that. They just look like normal commercial planes leaving. It's just strange. They even have their own private terminal that all the, you know, workers go to. I guess you can't be intermingling those people with the general population, I guess. Now, recently, the internet and anyone with a pulse has seen all this stuff about people storming Area 51. That see them aliens thing that's been all over Facebook. Being so close to Las Vegas, I'm sure there will be some strange things to add if we do this list again. There's probably enough material for five more lists about strange Vegas I could do right now. I'm in the middle on this one. I don't know what they have going on in Area 51, and I'm not sure I really care. I do think it's got the potential to be really bad, but I'm not sure for who, the military or the people that want to test them. Anyway, I wake up this morning getting ready to upload this video and I see that over a million people say they're going to essentially flash mob Area 51 sometime in September. I hope they'll be dancing. Those are the best flash mobs. But with over a million saying that they're going to go to Area 51 and do this, well, in the world of the internet, that translates to maybe 10,000 people. We'll see. 10,000 people is still a lot of people to be storming Area 51. I don't know if they'll be storming, but I'm sure they're going to go to the fence and be met with resistance and just kind of stand there and essentially protest. I don't think anyone's actually storming Area 51, but we'll see how it all plays out in the, I guess, next month and a half. 
All right, let's take a look at the final one. And it is not a city. It is not a place in the United States. It's actually a country. We did one of these on Mexico. Let's take a look. What is going on everyone, or should I say que paso? Today, I thought we would do what so many people have been asking me to do, some videos about outside of the United States. Today, we'll be tackling Mexico. I get all forms of communication to this channel, comments, emails, Twitter, Instagram, DMs. I even get traditional mail to my PO box occasionally. One of the most frequent subjects is why do I call it World According to Briggs when I only do things about the US? Well, because I really didn't have a plan when I started this and kind of named it that. I thought I would eventually branch out of the US, but I really haven't felt much of a need. Truth be told, I currently have about two years worth of list ideas already, and every week we add a couple more, and 95% of them are about the United States. But since international videos get requested so much, a couple months back I did one on Vancouver, British Columbia, and Canada. Now it did okay, but not great, but it was okay. I did have one guy email me about how he unsubscribed because I must hate America because I'm making videos about Canada. Almost all of you right now are going, huh? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I was like, what? I didn't follow his logic either. Anyway, so he's gone because of a Vancouver, Canada video. Who knew? Seeing that we did a video about our neighbors to the north, we should probably take a look at our neighbors to the south. Mexico. Mexico is right here. It's home to 126 million people. That's a lot of people and has some incredibly interesting history. A couple of ancient civilizations, a handful of revolutions, a war with the United States back in the mid 1800s. Today, we're not going to look at the history or statistics about Mexico. We're looking at the weird stuff about our neighbors to the south. So grab a margarita and watch my top 10 strange things about Mexico. Number 10, Sacrifice. Back in the Aztec days, in order to appease and worship their gods, these people would sacrifice their own people. During certain rituals every year, it's believed they would sacrifice up to 1% of the population, which is equal to about 2,000, 2,500 people, somewhere in that neighborhood. Some scholars believe it was more like 250,000 in total over the span of the civilization that were sacrificed during these rituals. I did a paper about the Aztecs when I was in college, and some believe that the number of sacrificed was more like 200,000 a year. Most researchers and most scholars chalk those guys up to crazy Aztec fanboys because it's it's really that's that's too many people. It's it just seems impossible. You would be knocking off 550 Aztecs a day for 365 days. That's tiring. You know, when you're sacrificing people and you get winded, you know, you just can't be doing that all day long. I think if I saw this happening down at the temple, I would quietly go home, pack up my family, and tell them we are going to live as Aztec nomads for now on. We are just going to wander the jungle until we meet friends that don't have a hankering to dispatch thy neighbor up to 1% every year. Number nine, volcanoes. Mexico has many volcanoes and is home to one of the smallest volcanoes in the world. Cuexcamate is only about 43 feet high and 75 feet in diameter. This is an inactive volcano located in Puebla, which makes it the perfect place to go visit. I mean, it's south of um, Mexico City, so you're probably gonna be touristing there anyway. Might as well go down and see the world's smallest volcano. The volcano even has a spiral staircase inside of it, so you can go down and see what's cracking downstairs. Like I said, it's an inactive volcano, but keep in mind, also that I think Mount St. Helens was an inactive volcano for a while right before it blew up. I don't think it's very dangerous because they built a playground right around it. There's a whole little park there and a playground, but it is Mexico and it might be dangerous and nobody clued in that a playground next to a volcano is a bad idea. This thing's really so small. It's like a pimple on the earth. It's really not that big. Number eight, an underground river. Below the Yucatan Peninsula is the Sacatoon River System, or White Caves, as it translates. This is the longest underground river known to man. Well, I guess, of course, it's known to man. I probably didn't have to say that. If it wasn't known to man, how would we be talking about it? Anyway, I mean, it was known to fish for a long time. Anyway, moving on. It flows through 95 miles of limestone caves. Prior to 2018, it wasn't the longest. A subterranean river in the Philippines was thought to be the longest underground river in the world. But in 2018, a discovery of a link between the Sacatoon System and the Dos Anjos 
system, you know, kind of cannot combine those two together to one, made it way longer than the one in the Philippines. The combined system is now considered the largest underwater cave system in the world. These rivers in Cenotes are crazy. They look like something from a ride at Disneyland, like Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that. It's really neat. Number seven, language diversity. Although it's common knowledge that Spanish is the official language of Mexico, there's a total of 68 official languages recognized in the country and possibly even more unofficial ones. Some of the top languages besides Spanish are Nahuatl, which is spoken by 1.7 million citizens. Mayan, yeah, they're still sticking around. At least these days, you know, they're not like the Aztecs and they're knocking people off. Anyway, Mayan is spoken as well as Mixtec. Mixtec is a great story. It has been around forever, so don't think the tech sound means it's new. It's not. And I've heard it pronounced differently too, not mixed tech, and I'm not even going to get into it. I'm struggling enough on this video with pronunciations and stuff. I'm just going to let it go. But this dialect is spoken in the mountain regions of central Mexico. There wasn't much known about it outside of Mexico and pretty much this mountain region until the 1990s. A graduate student from the U.S. went down and actually wrote it down. Some say it was never actually documented prior to this graduate student in the 19, late 1990s, I guess it was. And this is where we get some kind of language nerd leaving a comment. So just stop typing. Nobody likes a grammar cop. They sure as hell don't want to have a language history cop. But yeah, they got a lot of languages spoken in this country. No word if the Aztecs left their language around. I don't even know what they spoke. Ax, I don't know. Number six, Chihuahua. Taco Bell isn't the only reason most people associate Chihuahuas with Mexico. Chihuahuas are originally from Mexico. They are the smallest breed of dog and is named after the area in Mexico, Chihuahua. Oddly enough, Chihuahua is the biggest state in Mexico. Smallest dog, big state, kind of weird. Speaking of Taco Bell, a comedian is the voice of that dog. His name is Carlos Alasraki. If you remember the show Reno 911, he played Deputy James Garcia. He has also done all kinds of voiceover work from Disney's Planes, Happy Feet, Fairly Odd Parents, SpongeBob SquarePants, and The American Dad. He even reprised his role as the Taco Bell Chihuahua in a Geico commercial with the little lizard dude kind of neat. The dude has gotten a lot of work, and I would say his big break came from playing the Chihuahua from Taco Bell. Kind of cool. I met him once. He's a really nice guy. Doesn't know me. We just met. Shook his hand. Told him I loved his Taco Bell commercials. And he lifted his eyebrows at me and looked at me like, you're crazy, and walked away. It was kind of cool. Number five, happiness. Mexicans have been proven to be one of the happiest people in the world. According to the World Happiness Report, it's a thing, the World Happiness Report, in 2018, Mexico was ranked 22nd out of 156 countries on their happiness. This is up one from the previous year where they were 23rd. Of course, that would be one up out of 156 countries. The reason this is strange and on this list, most of my viewers are from the United States. And in the United States, we seem to just see the negatives in the news about Mexico. Now, Mexico does have a big list of negatives, a very big list. All countries have some sort of, you know, negativities, but we get, you know, them on blast here in the United States. But once you get past all the things that have to do with the border and border towns and the crime, and you get into central Mexico, you will find that most of the Mexican people care about their religion and their families, and they're really good people. There was a documentary on Netflix called Happy. In the documentary, they explored happiness, in case the title didn't tip you off to that. One thing that jumped out was that people that are close to their families and usually have some religious views are happier than other people, no matter what their financial situation is. Number four, folklore. Mexican children are some of the most well-behaved children on the planet. This is because in Mexican culture, they scare the crap out of their kids with folk tales to make them behave. It's like scared straight bedtime stories. You have tales like that of the man who whistles, which basically he's a Mexican boogeyman who wanders around with a big bag of bones. He sneaks in the kid's room and takes out the bones and starts counting them. If you don't wake up during the counting, you never wake up. If you wake up, scares them away and you never see them. But anyway, then you have El Kakui and of course the Alley of Hands, which these floating hands from some teenagers that apparently killed a priest. And now if you go down this alley, the hands try and choke. It's weird. They try and choke people apparently. Anyway, so these are all gory and horrible stories that try and scare your kids into doing things like staying in at night. You got the Chupacabra, the goat sucker. 
if you get caught out at night, you could get caught by him and, you know, he's going to kill you. So, yeah, it's all just really weird and really demented. But, hey, that's the, how they keep their kids in line. That's fine. In the United States, we just threatened to shut down their Fortnite account and, you know, then threaten our daughters of buying them nothing but turtleneck sweaters. Number three, silver. For the past several years, Mexico has become the best country for silver mining in the world. While the global silver production is down by about 4.1%, Mexico's silver production is up by 5%, or about 10 million ounces a year. In 2017, the country was able to produce 196 million ounces of silver. Now, I'm sure that would have been far better news in 1980 when silver was going for about $114 an ounce. Currently, it's about $15 an ounce. The people of Mexico are really hoping Kodak and Polaroid go back to using film and cameras. They're like praying for that every day. At one point, photography consumed massive amounts of silver due to its light-sensitive characteristics. As non-silver photography has come to dominate the field, there's less of a demand. Likewise, there's a large stock pile of, you know, old film that they actually are recycling, getting the silver out of. So silver these days is, relatively speaking, dirt cheap, which kind of sucks for Mexico, but at least they're getting something. Number two, Yucatan. Yucatan is an area in southeast Mexico along the Gulf at the very tip of the country. The area got its name from a misunderstanding when the Spaniards came. They asked the natives what the area was called and they responded by saying Yucatan, which is translated into their native language as, I don't understand you. The Spaniards thought that they were responding with the name of the place, but no, they're all like, yeah, what, what the hell are you talking about? That's what they were saying to them. So ever since, it's been called Yucatan. And that story reminds me of my grandmother ordering Chinese food. Nothing like seeing an elderly Irish woman and an elderly Chinese woman argue over the size of egg rolls for 20 minutes when you're 12 years old. Just going back and forth. And neither of them understood what either one was saying. It was incredible. And number one, Mexico City sinking. The demand for water is so high in Mexico that it's actually causing Mexico City to sink up to three feet per year in some areas. Underneath the city is an aquifer. Basically, it's a space underground which contains water from nearby lakes and rivers. Since the demand is so high, water has been taken from this area, making the city sink into the empty space. Now, I've also seen that some areas have dropped on average between eight and 19 inches in a year. It's not just sinking the same rate everywhere. It's like a giant tetra game for building planners. That must suck. You buy your house in 1980, eight steps up to the front door, now it's three steps down. You had a place with a nice view of the park, and now your front door looks three feet up to the sidewalk. Just since the 1960s, the city has sunk over 32 feet in some areas. That's a lot of ground. This is a city of just under 9 million people that is slowly sinking and could potentially collapse into itself. That's kind of scary. It's a beautiful city, too. If you've never been to Mexico City, it has some beautiful old buildings. It's an amazing place. Place. It really is. All right, so that's my top 10 strange things about Mexico. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. I hope you like the international ones. I'm not going to do them all the time, just occasionally. So I hope you guys enjoy them. Uh, and to all the people that have been buying the black and pink to be nice to each other t-shirt, uh, thanks. I didn't think adding, you know, pink lettering to it would sell that many t-shirts, but uh, thank you. Anyway, don't forget all the links below. Buy a t-shirt if you want. There's links in my description area. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other. All right, that's today's video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. If you'd like to see more videos like this, kind of resurrect the series, let us know which locations you'd like us to do. Maybe we'll do one. Have a great day. Be nice to each other.